Hi, I'm Dr. David Dobson. Welcome to Conversations. Today, my guest is Dr. Nagan Mo. Nagan is a lecturer in digital marketing at the University of Exeter Business School. Her research interests include digital marketing, sustainable marketing, and information privacy. She has presented her work at several peer-reviewed conferences. Nagan earned her PhD from the University of Manitoba. It's a great pleasure to have you with me today, Nagan. Uh, thanks. Thanks for having me today. Your doctoral research looks into consumers' right on controlling their digital information. Please share what this study is about. Um, okay, so before I, I, I give more details about my research, I would like to just give you the background information. So. Uh, so now you are in Canada, right? Yes, yes. So even if you are in the United States, yes. uh, if you go into any website, you yes. may encounter two, three different scenarios. Yeah. Um, the first scenario is you, you may see the cookie notice that yes. uh, asks you to accept or deny the use of the cookie, which right. means the online platform giving you the right to control your digital footprint. Yes. Um, the second situation is you encounter the cookie notice, but it's forced you to accept yeah. the cookies That's without right. giving you any option to deny it. Yeah. Um, and the third situation is you don't really see any notification regarding to that, that kind of stuff. So okay. uh, my investigation of the top 200 American and Canadian uh, firms listed okay. by Forbes suggested that 56% of the firms they remain silent. They don't really show up oh, wow. any notification regarding to uh, mm. cookie notice, even though they still, you know, use the consumer information without consumer knowledge, oh. right? Yeah. Only 16% of the firm that explicitly inform the consumers that um, they give the consumer rights to control the information explicitly. Okay. So in my research, uh, I'm looking at how these three different approaches um, impact the way that the consumer protect their privacy boundaries yeah. and under which condition is basically informing consumers about their rights to control the information can can help to mitigate or reduce their privacy protection uh, protection behaviors okay yeah why were you interested in this topic um yeah that's a very interesting question so um <laughs> in my second years of MBA program yeah. when I decided to apply for the PhD. Uh -huh. um, I kind of think, okay, what kind of topics that can keep me interested uh -huh. in just a longer time, like four years or five years? Yeah. Uh, I'm thinking that, okay, what kind of topics that make me still love it? Even those yeah. may be able, even those may be able to get rejected, but I'm still love it. <laughs> and then at that time, um, there's a Cambridge Analytica you know, scandal just Oh, yeah, happened. yeah, that was a big if, one, if yeah. You re, yeah, if you remember that time. Yes, I do. And then I kind of feel like, okay, with the, the own the developments of technology, uh -huh. uh, in the next few years, yeah. consumer information privacy is going to be the topic mm -hmm. that they need more and more research, researcher yeah. to, to look into it because of the privacy regulation, the industry cell regulation, or the consumers themselves, they're also trying to protect their privacy, even though... Yeah online or apply. So yeah. I think, yeah, I, I love doing that kind of topic because it's uh, kind of personally meaningful to me yeah. as a consumer. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's how it's drawn me to this topic. So how did you go about conducting this research? Um, so in doing my research, uh, I apply in a moon time methods approach uh, because I think it's very important to answer the research question from different perspectives. Uh -huh. so, um, so there's a one study in my dissertation, I I trying to scrape the consumer text and then do the text analysis okay. in order to see how the consumer um, protect their privacy before, okay. during, and after the event that took away their rights to information control. Right. Um, another study, yeah. I collaborated with the uh, industry partner to mm -hmm. run the ads on social media, oh, okay. on Instagram or on Facebook in order to test my hypothesis. Okay. And in other study, I use, you know, online experiments 
uh, MTurk or prolific or even students in order okay. to have a more, you know, holistic yeah, uh, yeah. big pictures about yeah, yeah. Um, my research. Yeah, yeah. Okay. What did you learn from your research? So um, I actually, I learned a lot from my research. Um, yeah. There's a lot of moments that I have to, you yeah. know, sell, yeah. toss myself about a new yeah. methodology, but yeah. it's a long journey, but um, yeah, I learned a lot. So uh, first, the first one I learned is contrary to the general belief that the consumer um, don't care about their privacy. Okay. Uh, my research showed that actually they care. Mm. Um, they care about their privacy and they mm -hmm. proactively protect their privacy boundaries as long as they know that there's some kind of violation just happened to their, okay. to their um, privacy, information okay. privacy. Okay. Um, however, I found that for those firms that take the initiative to um, explicitly informing consumers about their information rights, their, their mm. information control rights, yeah. um, that initiative is not very effective as okay. previously thought because okay. that may direct the consumer attention yeah. to the privacy-related issues that a consumer yeah. might, not, might not think of otherwise. Okay. And this may trigger their privacy yeah. protection behavior yeah. to a greater extent compared to remaining silence. Yeah. Yeah. Um, however, uh -huh. I found they found I found few conditions under which such initiative can become effective. Yeah. Um, so when the consumer um, concerned about their privacy, uh -huh. they will look for those platforms that give them just you know um, okay. rights to control the information because right. they will trust that platform more, yeah. and it's ended up that they more likely to disclose accurate information to the platform. Right. Um, the second condition is the firms actually can utilize some kind of strategy like mm -hmm. um, sh to show that they offer the consumer rights to information control voluntarily mm -hmm. or are obligatory. In other words, in adherence to the privacy um, regulation. Okay. So these two approaches can help to give the consumer the reassurance uh -huh. um, and then they will be more likely to 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 be less likely to protect their privacy boundaries compared yeah. to the firm that do nothing. Okay. Um, but actually, I also found just kind of strategy just work in okay. those companies in the in in the United States and in Canada okay. or in North America in North okay. America. Okay. Because we don't have currently we don't have the comprehensive privacy regulation in oh. place in North America. Okay. And also, as you know, that um, we don't, the firms don't really do that kind of thing in the voluntary basic. Okay. Um, so um, okay. that's, that's kind of strategy going to become more effective in North American okay. market. However, okay. it's yeah. backfire in Germany. Uh -huh. um, in that, um, because it's the, this, this the result kind of surprising to me because we know that in, in in Europe in general and in Germany in particular, uh -huh. uh, we have just a very comprehensive and very stringent privacy regulation in place. Okay. Um, every single time when the consumer visit any website, uh -huh. uh, whether they are the first user or whether they regular user, they always see the pop up not notification okay. uh, about their their privacy. Okay. Uh, but it ended up the consumer feel annoyed, yeah, or they feel uh, fatigue, yeah. which just kind of notification, and yeah. it becomes they they don't trust the firm anymore, um, yeah. and by emphasizing the firm's voluntary offer or obligatory uh -huh. offer yeah. of information control rights, yeah. it actually doesn't really work in okay. Germany anymore because okay. the consumer becomes desensitized with this okay. kind of practice. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. those are kind of the three um, findings uh, yeah. from my from my okay. research. I, I was just wondering, you know, what about some of this privacy watchdogs or government legislations and, and different types of policies? I thought they probably safeguard consumers' privacy or you think that they are not very effective? Oh, actually, I think that's, um, um, it's, it's effective and it's not effective at the same time, okay. right? Um, yeah. we, still need, we still need something. We still need yeah. the regulation yeah. in order to protect the consumer well-being. Yes. Um, and in order to give the firm some kind of penalties when the firm yeah. violate to oh. the regulation. Okay. Um, 
But what I learned is that the firms do not fully comply oh, right. with the regulation. They still know some ways in order to take advantage of the consumer information. Okay. Uh, uh, but the more importantly is consumer know that oh, consumer right. knows that their firms do not re, you know fully comply with the regulation uh -huh. and that's why the consumer retaliate by don't really just any kind of you know pop up notification yeah. anymore okay. um so this is the, the big question for all of us <laughs> how can we do yes right yeah. because yeah. as a human being yes. we are still trying to protect our privacy uh, and as yeah. the people have yeah. more knowledge about this yeah. one in the digital economy, yeah. they will know more and more ways to protect yeah. their privacy. Yeah. So this is the question for regulators. Mm -hmm. This is the question for the firms. Mm -hmm. How can you benefit from this digital economy yeah. while protecting um, the consumers, you know, um, information privacy? Mm -hmm. Because this is very important. If you don't yeah. do this kind of good job, yeah. you're going to get the retaliation from the consumers. That's true. Um, and that's yeah. the reason that I fell from the Germany case. It's a okay. very interesting. Okay. What were some of your important research findings? Uh, so that's, uh, I think that I just talked about my research finding and okay. the, the, the very interesting yeah. uh, finding for me yeah. is yeah. because um, I hypothesized that yeah. uh, voluntary offer and obligatory yeah. offer yeah. will be will be effective okay. in reducing consumer privacy protection behavior in okay. North America. Okay. Um, reason why okay. um, that effectiveness may be become more, become less pronounced or okay. um, attenuated in Europe, in Germany. However, I found a backfire effect um, in Germany mm -hmm. where when the firm emphasized that, okay, I. Uh, offer you the rights to information control voluntarily, consumer yeah. become more skeptical. Okay. And they just they just trigger their privacy protection behavior um, okay. to a greater extent compared to doing nothing. Okay. So I think that is one of very interesting um, kind of fighting and it's had okay. the implication too. Mm -hmm. So as you know that mm -hmm. Canada and um, the United States and other countries, yes. now they try to revise their privacy regulation in the way that um, make it kind of similar to GDPR in Europe, okay. right? And mm -hmm. they're trying to encourage the firm to give consumer more rights to information control. Right. Um, however, yeah. the backfire effect I found in Germany may be replicated if mm -hmm. we, in this region, if we follow that kind of um, initiative, but okay. the firm don't fully uh, comply to the regulation and at okay. some point when the consumer they become more yeah. skeptical of the yeah. genuine uh, commitment and then they yeah. may retaliate yeah so yeah uh, so that's a kind of interesting kind of fighting from my research yeah. do you have any advice for students who wish to continue similar type of research um i think that my advice is gonna be um we need more and more um cross-national comparative studies okay. in the privacy domains okay. because the consumer privacy knowledge is very different. Yeah. Um, the privacy regulation for each country is very different, yeah. right? Uh, we yeah. can see that in Europe, we have a comprehensive privacy regulation in place yeah. and yeah. the consumer in that area, they're very aware. They're very aware of their rights. I think that there's a need for yeah. um, cross-national yeah. um comparative studies yeah. because we know that um, the consumer privacy knowledge is very different across yeah. countries and yeah. also the privacy regulation is very different. Like yeah. in Europe, we have a comprehensive privacy reg regulation in place and the consumer, they're very, very aware of their privacy mm -hmm. rights. However, in North America, um, that kind of concept is not very clear and mm. the privacy regulation is not something mm. that strong, that's not mm. strong enough, right? Mm. So yeah. um, each province in Canada or each yes. state in America, they have their own laws yes. in doing that. So it's yeah. a very fragmented um, yeah. nature. Um, yeah. And for those countries like um, India or Vietnam, they, okay. their digital economy is growing right. quickly. Why yeah. the concepts about information privacy is something that people yeah. don't really knows about so right. but the yeah. better difference is in terms of the consumers and okay the privacy yeah. regulation going to be the place that people can do more research about that because it's so right. interesting yes. to learn more about that
you were recently uh, appointed a lecturer in digital marketing at University of Exeter Business School in the UK. Uh, how are you adjusting to new place and you, your new teaching responsibilities? Oh, uh, thank you. So <laughs> to be honest, I'm still trying to <laughs> familiarize myself with okay. the new environment because yeah. it's uh, very different, right? Uh, yes. So a little bit about my background, I... I uh, I travel quite a lot. I yes. uh, study in Vietnam, in Portugal, in Hawaii, in Canada, and now in UK. So I can okay. see the difference in terms of the educational system. Yeah. Um. So, like the the main difference in terms of the teaching is, uh, from in Manitoba when I taught fundamentals of marketing classes. So yeah. I I manage the whole class with like 30 students, 40 students, right? And yeah. I'm responsible for the whole classes. And yeah. I have a lot of, you know, I created in terms of um, <clears throat> designing the course or the activity yeah. to, to get engaged with the student. Yeah. But here in UK, the class size is super, like it's big, like few hundred students, 500 students, 700 <laughs> students. So basically like um, there's gonna be have the model lead of the yeah. course. And then okay. you have other four or five people gonna support teaching that classes. Okay. Um, so you have the lecture, the whole the whole lectures, and then okay. you're gonna divide it into um, seminars. Okay. Which is seminar gonna have a thirty or forty student or something? Okay. So basically, here's most about cooperation in teaching. Okay. Um, and they have the framework because everything has to follow with the standard with the with the framework. Oh, I see. Why in Canada? What my experience with yeah. University of Manitoba is that such a small class yeah. size, and I have yeah. total power yeah. <laughs> in designing yeah. the activity. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. that's the one um, significant, okay. you know, difference between okay. the system in Canada and in UK. Yeah. Um. But my but my uh, because my uh, contracts is most about research, so okay. I just have one term focusing on uh, teaching and okay. the rest are focused on, on research, so okay, nice. uh, somehow I have time for doing nice. research um, nice. during the year. Nice. Yeah. Well, all the best, uh, Negan, there. Thank you for your time, Nagan. Uh, have a great rest of your day. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, thanks for having me.